Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello and welcome. I am Dan, your friendly fishmonger at dansfish.com. We do this live stream every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. That is at 9 Eastern for those who might be mountain challenged or just not know where the mountains are. <laughs> um, thanks for coming by on your Wednesday evening. Hope you enjoy it. We're going to start with our shipping report. After that, we'll talk about our giveaway. And then after that, we'll get into questions and comments and just have a, a discussion about fish and fish keeping. So cheers and welcome. Mm. Oh, I forgot to fill this up before the stream. I'm going to run out. Going to run out of water. Okay. So, okay. Oh, man. Stream time. Got to start. Transfer from, like, I've been feeding fish and stuff most of the afternoon. I got to transfer from fish feeding brain to people brain. Live streaming brain. So, here we go. Resetting and three, two, one. Okay, let's start with the uh, shipping report. So it's not great, but it's not horrible. Uh, last time I reported to you, we were at 98.93% success rate. We have dropped by one hundredth of a percent to 98.92. So just down just a tick. And part of that is uh, we experienced another round of delays. So two, three times a year. I'd have to look at last year, something, something around like three times last year. There was a delay where none of the packages that we shipped out made it on time. They were all delayed by one day, at least. It doesn't happen often. Again, like maybe three times a year. This is the second time this year. Uh, the first time it happened, the airplane that's supposed to pick up our cargo just never showed up. <laughs> this time, um, we got all the uh, packages Monday. This was Monday. We got all the packages up to UPS on time. Um, everything looked fine. And they got on the plane and the pilot went down the runway, turned around, came back, said, nope, I'm not flying. Uh, what had happened is a freak storm had rolled in. About five o'clock when we delivered the packages, everything was fine. Six o'clock when the pilot was going to take off, um, a freak storm had blown in. This doesn't happen often at all, but it happened Monday. And a nice, calm, clear day quickly, like the temperature plummeted, and we got really bad blizzard conditions. And what happened is the pilot tried to take off, but while he was on the runway, his windshield literally iced over and he couldn't see anything. So he's like, yeah, I can't fly in this. So we unloaded all the boxes and uh, brought them back here to be nice and toasty. Um, so those, almost all of those went out yesterday. Some folks needed to postpone and reschedule, but, um, almost all of those went out yesterday and I'm happy to report very few losses. So we did take care of them yesterday, checked everyone, make sure they were okay. If anyone had water that was a little iffy or whatever, you know, we changed that water and refreshed the fish and everything. But, um, yeah, it went pretty well. However, anytime that happens, there's going to be you know, some fallout. And so they're very little, but a little higher losses. So I, I think, um, I think that's part of uh, why we slipped down by one hundredths of a percent to 98.92. Our goal is 99%. So we have eight hundredths of a percent to go. And I think we'll get there. Uh, we have also been interviewing for the last oh, week and a half, uh, someone to be our fish, our chief fish health officer whose sole job is to keep an eye on the fish, diagnose fish, treat fish, make sure they get the proper nutrition, just an eagle eye on all the fish and do things like, you know, test fish out. We'll try this medicine and this medicine and see which one works better or keep records of, uh, you know, if we get fish from this supplier, this medicine worked best and really be dedicated to all of that. So that we can, part of the goal is Instead of being like, okay, here's the procedure we're going to use because most of the time it, in our experience and consulting with the veterinarian, etc., it seems to, you know, have the, the most likelihood of working. We want to switch from that to someone who can actually work up each fish, diagnose the issue and be like, oh, I found this parasite. Here's what treats that parasite. And then we can target treat what the actual issues are 
instead of kind of going like, okay, we'll do this and this and this, and you know, that treats a wide range of things, and that's most likely to work. So um, I'm really excited about the possibility of hiring that position. Uh, this gentleman's been working with us for about a week and a half, and uh, um, so far things are going pretty well. But, you know, it's a, there's a lot to learn, and there's some more things we need to figure out before we move forward with the position, but it's looking pretty good. So I'm, I'm really excited about figuring that position out because I think that'll make the big difference from always being slightly under our goal of 99% to actually meeting and maybe surpassing our goal of 99% success rate shipping the fish. So that's what we're looking for. Um, yeah, it's just, a, it's just an expertise that I don't have and it's hard to find. It's been a difficult position to hire. So. We're still in that process. We're getting towards the end of that process, I hope. But, uh, and it's, again, I'm pretty excited. It's going pretty well. But I think that'll put us over the edge. Okay, so that's the shipping report. Let's move on to the giveaway. So tonight's giveaway is for free shipping. I don't really have, like, a picture of that to show you. <laughs> Usually I'm giving away a fish or a shrimp or a snail or something, and then I have a picture of that fish to show you. But, um... Uh, free shipping there's no like I don't have to explain the species or the care or my experience with them or whatever it's just you can get um, your order shipped for free, free excuse me and it can be any size order by the way it's not limited to just a small box if you've uh, got a, a giant size box in the cart and haven't pulled the trigger um, we'll pay for the shipping on a giant box whatever the size order is we'll, we'll cover free shipping for you so that's the deal on this kind of giveaway so with that, let's go ahead and give you the hashtag if you would like to enter to get free shipping. And by the way, you can give this away if you aren't ordering or in the process of ordering anytime soon. Um, there's lots of people that could use that. So if you win and you can't use it, you can transfer that to someone else as well. That's not a problem. So enter hashtag free ship. That's hashtag F-R-E-E-S-H-I-P. No spaces, capitalization does not matter. And you will be entered to win and also only enter once. We've enabled anti-spam. So if you enter multiple times, you will be disqualified. We do that just so the feed doesn't get clogged. And it, it literally doesn't help you to enter more than once anyway. Um, even if I don't click that, it just spams the chat. So single entries only. All right, so that is uh, the shipping report and the giveaway, Free Willy. <laughs> Who's that? Is that Coro? It went so fast, I couldn't really see who that was. <laughs> free boat. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Free Nacho Libre. Um, so I do have some good news. Folks have been asking about the Micropocelia picta. That's sometimes called the Red Swamp Guppy, which is a very unflattering name for an absolutely gorgeous little live bear. So I, I hope we can find a better name for it, but that's kind of seems to be the name. They're these. They're beautiful little live bear. They look uh, a lot like a guppy or um, an endler. They're not. They're a completely different genus than either of those. Uh, just a really pretty little aquarium fish. We've had a group, we've been working on them for about a month. Um, just, they're rare and they're expensive. And this is our first time actually having them. And we wanted to make sure that they were all healthy and fat and sassy before we shipped them. So we've been working on them. Uh, we d had um, an exam on them done, I believe yesterday. And looks like they're all clear. We didn't see any parasites. We didn't see any uh, issues at all. So we're going to be listing these for sale. Um, I believe tomorrow these should go up and be available. Unless Johnny can get to it tonight. Johnny, if you get to it tonight, let us know. But if not, we'll have these up tomorrow. This is one that I've been looking forward to for a long time. It's just taken a while to get the medications through them, make sure everyone's stable, and uh, make sure they're ready to go. So... That's one I'm very excited about. Um, besides that, a couple other neat things that have happened here is we've got a, a new piece of equipment. I talked about it last week. We're having a little, not trouble, but 
it's a process getting a piece of equipment like that dialed in. It's uh, much more dialed in. It'll be tomorrow when the Micropocele Picta is listed, says Johnny. Okay, good. Um, that piece of equipment is much more dialed in now. And so everyone, if you, if you got fish from us this week, uh, let us know, please, if there were any issues, any deflated bags, any leaks, anything like that. But everything's looking pretty good from what we can tell. So I think we've got this new piece of equipment working pretty well now. And it's awesome. It's, um, I don't know, double or triple our efficiency. It's really, really helpful. I have to crunch the numbers after we get a little more data and see exactly how much it's helping. But it's helping a lot. And it's, uh, it also prevents... Uh, us when we're working on the line to seal the fish and pack them and get them sent out to you guys from having so many motions with our wrists and our elbows. So just like the, the fatigue, the repetitive movement kind of wear and tear on a body is greatly reduced with this piece of equipment. So I'm excited about that too. I don't want anyone getting, uh, you know, stress injuries from repeated movements, which, which can happen when you're working in an industry like this. So Pretty excited about that. Have um, a whole bunch of fish coming next week. Uh, some some exciting stuff. I, I'm sorry for everyone that wants red tail eels. The breeder still does not have any dwarf red tail eels available. I tried. Um, and what was the other one everyone wants? The blue flame or blue flash agazizii. Um, no more of those available yet either. So I, I keep working on them. I'm trying. But we do have a bunch of really cool stuff coming in next week. And so, uh, yeah, stuff that a lot of people have been looking for. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you more about that after it gets here and everything. But just a little teaser. Lots of really cool stuff. And tomorrow and the next day we'll be listing a lot of new things as well. Um, so things are... Things are going pretty well here. It was really nice to get that new, new piece of equipment up and running and to, to the point where we're like much more comfortable with it and aren't as nervous about it. Um, but again, 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 like please let us know if you have any leaky bags or any problems while we're dialing this in. That would be very helpful information. I don't think so, though. Usually that stuff's reported uh, pretty readily. <laughs> People are not happy when that happens. Um, thankfully, it almost never happens. So that's the good news. All right, with that, let's go ahead and get to your questions and comments. First, I'm going to respond to Gary Williams, who's been a member for 18 months. Thank you. Thanks for sticking with it for a year and a half, Gary. Much appreciated. And hello right back to you. Mountain Greenery says, hi, thanks for the shipping report. It's always good to hear what's going on. Yeah, I, um, you know, it's been a while since I've talked about this. Uh, and there's a lot of new people here. So, in fact, how many people are here? 439. That's pretty good. Pretty good for this little station, this, this little live stream. Thanks for being here, folks. Oh, drop to 381. <laughs> Jeez, I think maybe it just was way behind. Okay, 382. We'll, we'll go with it. Um, but the reason I do that report is I'm, I'm trying to be transparent with people and uh, trying to, you know, we claim that we do things in a way that has a higher success, a higher su survival rate for the fish, better quality fish, and... Um, and that they get to the customer in much better shape. And I think like 90, like almost all the time that's true. Every now and then something will slip by us. Every now and then. But um, like, like for example, oh, should I go into that specific? Yeah, that might, the customer might want, not, not want me to, I don't want to reveal anything about a customer. So I, I can't give that example. But um, anyway, almost always that's the case. And the reason people can be confident is that case because is because we're transparent about it. We literally tell you the problems we have. And if a whole bunch of people chime in in the chat and are like, actually my experience sucked and all my fish die and dance fish don't get to me alive and all this, all this and that, then you can know that we're not telling the truth. So that's why we do the shipping report. We're trying to uh, build a relationship with our customers of transparency where they actually know what's going on and also, it keeps us honest. It keeps us trying. 
Um, in fact, there was a case today where there were some fish that were uh, going to go out, and um, I saw them, and I was like, no, we can't send those out. Like, they're not fat and sassy enough. Um, we just, we can't start down that slippery slope of, oh, it's on the, it's borderline, it'll probably be fine. We, we can't start that. We have to just keep the standards high, high, high. And as long as we do that, then we should always have good shipping reports. And there shouldn't be a bunch of chatter in the chat about how wrong it is and how bad we are. So that's why we do this. That's why we do the shipping reports. It keeps us honest and it keeps our standards high if we have to actually uh, report publicly about how we're doing. So we try to build the incentives. Um, we try to operate so that the incentives align with our mission. You know, we're, we're trying to treat the fish right and treat our customer right. And so we kind of have built things so if we don't, there's really heavy repercussions. That keeps us incentivized to do good work. Hunter McLaren, I have a high flow aquarium with Rominos tetras and plecos. I'm curious if there are any other South American fish you'd recommend that would fit into that fast flowing environment. Let's see here. Yes, I think that Caracidium would be awesome. Those are the hummingbird tetras or darter tetras. Caracidium. They are these. They uh, are kind of South America's answer to a darter. Like rainbow darters, orange throat darters, swamp darters, that kind of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> they perch on the bottom, just like a darter, like that perched up on the fins stance, just like an American darter. They don't have a swim bladder. If they do, it's very curtailed. And they just uh, swim around the bottom. And they, they can take pretty darn high flow. Um, and that is a South American fish that I think would go well in that. I'm trying to think of some other things that are from South America that would really like flow. And don't get too big. Like there's, there are fish that really like the flow but, but tend to get big and be chunkier. Like a pink tail chalcius, for example, would, would love flow. Yeah, I think the darter tetra is the, the one that comes to mind. I'm going to stick with that one for now. Mountain Greenery, is your giveaway only for U.S. peeps? Um, it's, let's see here. No, I don't think so. I think we'll do it for anyone. Yeah, as long as you can order. So right now we're currently shipping to the United States and, and Puerto Rico, which is, you know, halfway part of the United States, I guess. And um, we do ship to Canada, but we're not shipping to Canada until the weather improves. So th those are the places we currently ship. So I would say it would apply to any of those places. Um, Sherilyn, 1015. My fish were supposed to be shipped on Monday, and then they got delayed again. Ooh, today here in Pittsburgh. They are now supposed to be delivered tomorrow. Fingers crossed everyone is okay. Yeah, Sherilyn, my fingers crossed too. That's so rare. I'm so sorry that happened to you. I know, uh, I know sometimes, I mean, shipping fish and purchasing fish and receiving them through the mail is always an act of faith, right? And so when there's delays like that, I, I know that can be nerve wracking. So I apologize for that. Um, hopefully they get there in good shape, but let us know, like we're here for you. If, if, if things don't work out or even if they do, we'd like to know that as well. If there's problems, let us know, and uh, we will refund or reship, including the shipping, and uh, we'll take care of you. And if they do arrive in good shape, please let us know that too. That would be a relief. Divide by zero. Dan, I've been thinking about expanding into zebra cars. Oh, yeah. Little leery, though, because of pH requirements. How have you found them? I have not found them to have a pH requirement. Um, so I kept them in my old system. Back at the house, that has super, super soft water. Like two grains German degrees hardness. Like, like almost no minerals in that water. It's fresh snow runoff right from the mountain that I can see right over there. And uh, super soft and somewhat acidic. And they did fine in that. And here I have super hard alkaline water. And they do fine here as well. So pH is one of those things that I, I honestly don't think 
unless it's like massively extreme, matters so much for fish, especially if it's alkaline. Now, part of the reason for that is because pH and hardness tend to correlate. They aren't the same thing, but they tend to be correlated. So if you have fish in soft acidic water and you put them into hard alkaline water, the odds are it's not going to hurt them. In fact, it's probably going to help reduce osmotic stress because that water is full of minerals and electrolytes and things that actually help a fish. Fish from really soft acidic water struggle. But one of the challenges of adapting to those places is a lack of electrolytes, a lack of minerals. How are you going to deal with that? Um, so moving from soft acidic water to hard alkaline water is generally fairly easy on a fish. If a fish is used to hard alkaline mineral rich water, uh, even salty water, and then goes to soft water, that creates some osmotic stress. That has to happen kind of gradually or you uh, risk some osmotic stress on the fish. Um, but I've kept zebra cara in both situations. They've done fine in both situations. And honestly, I just keep the, the parameters stable. I wouldn't worry about trying to make them perfect. Just keep them steady. That would be my advice. If you have naturally hard alkaline water, just use that. If you have naturally soft water, use that. And you might need to buffer it a bit with some, you know, calcium-rich substrate, crushed coral or whatever, oreganite, um, or, you know, things like that. But, yeah, in my experience, they do fine. Um, folks here, if you have kept zebra cars, would you chime in and let us know your experience? Do you have hard alkaline water? Do you have soft water? Um, what are you keeping them in, and how do they seem to be doing? Let's uh, get the hive mind on board to give Divide by Zero some information more than I have, I guess, so that they can make a better decision. Grace Doyle, the two discus arrived nice and healthy. Bags were good, thanks. All right, Grace. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, anytime you ship discus, it's like there's a little extra on the uh, anxiety side. It, it's not bad anxiety, but, you know, anytime you ship fish out, like I said, it's an act of faith. So I'm glad to hear that it all went well, Grace. Thanks for letting us know. Big Steve's Glass Box Creations. The Maryland Club order showed up looking great. Didn't check the tent, but all bags felt the same. Love the printing on the bag. Awesome. I'm glad to hear it, Big, Big Steve. Um, yeah, whenever we're sending a box out to a club or anything like that, uh, that's a little extra special. So I'm glad to hear that that all went well. Awesome. Awesome. Spinster sister throwing down $10. Spinster, thank you so much for the generous super chat. Always appreciated. It's never required. But it is awesome when money is thrown at us. We appreciate that. My pineapple veil tail sword tail has been fry bound the past few days. A vet at Jess Gas, Dr. Christina C., suggested warm Epsom soap, Epsom, so Epsom salts, soaks, mushy peas to help digestive move, movement. Have you had trouble with them? I haven't had trouble with them. Um, and I mean, I guess my question would be is she truly fry bound? Or is she just, you know, big? Sometimes at the end there, before they give birth, if they have a lot of fry, sometimes it looks like, ooh, ooh, that, that can't be comfy. But sometimes it's normal for them to, you know, be pretty big, depending on how many fry they have. So my question would be, are we sure she's fry bound? Or is it just not her time yet? But yeah, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm no vet, but the suggestions that Dr. Christina C. suggested uh, Eps, warm up, warm. I mean, like, I wouldn't put her in too hot of water. I wouldn't go like 90 degrees or something. Um, again, I'm not a vet, but just sword tails in general tend to prefer a little bit cooler water. They come from, most of them come from these kind of mountain coastal streams where the water tends to be a little bit cooler. And um, so I don't know if there's a specific temperature suggested, but if not, I, you know, maybe I'd maybe aim for the low 80s. And Epsom salt, yes. Mushy peas, I haven't really tried that. I do know that if you do try that, you want to remove the skins from the peas to help them out. They can't really eat that. Um, and man, fingers crossed, Spinster. I, I hope that she does okay for you. Uncle Smiley's Aquarium. So, hey, thanks for joining up, Uncle Smiley. Welcome to the Fishmonger Crew. Thanks for becoming a member of the channel. Much appreciated. 
Any update on the July 4th event? Yes, we're having it. Killers, Reptiles, and Aquatics asks, any update? We are indeed going to have it. It is going to be... Um, so here's, here's that week. The third is Wednesday. I figure most people will be working on Wednesday. Then Thursday the 4th, people will have off the 4th through the 7th, I would imagine. Um, so my thought is, the 4th could be a day for folks to travel and will be open for a 4th of July barbecue event here at Dan's Fish, uh, the 5th and the 6th. So that's Friday and Saturday. And then Sunday the 7th, you know, folks can travel back home. So that's what I'm planning on, is opening our doors the 5th and the 6th, because I think that will fall into that 4th of July weekend uh, and still allow people to have the travel time they might need. So that's the plan. Um, and I'll get something official together and out. But yes, we're going to have the event. Thanks for asking, Bob. Appreciate it and hope you're doing well. Fish Hunter. On an average week, how many fish do you ship out? Just curious. Thanks. Well, um, I'm actually not going to divulge that because I want to keep my competition guessing. I don't necessarily want the competition to know how fast we're growing um, and have our exact numbers. So I like to keep them guessing. So I'm not going to give you that number. Um, almost everything we're transparent about, but there's a few things that I think it would behoove us to keep close to the vest. Now, if you and I were in person chatting, I'd probably tell you, but publicly where, you know, competitors can get the information. Yeah, no. Ashton, any plans on bringing in L134 leopard frog plecos? Yes. A breeder reached out to us recently and has some available. Um, I plan tomorrow and Friday or kind of Thursday a little bit and Friday, especially my days to try to catch up on my inbox. <laughs> so I do plan to respond to them and try to see if we can uh, get some aquarium bred, hobbyist bred leopard frog plecos here in the next couple weeks. Scaper Girl. Hey, Scaper Girl joined up as well. Look, it's raining members. That's awesome. Thank you, Scaper Girl. Thanks for joining the channel. Appreciate the support. Okay, scrolling because chat jumped. And the next one I can see after chat jumped so hard is... Oh, I actually got to some of those. So here it is. Fish for life. Agreed. 788. Expecting any more fantastic Congo Tetris in? No. Um, it's going to take a lot for me to bring that fish again. I'm going to have to find... There's very few suppliers supplying fish from that region. And I have to find a supplier that I can get healthy fish from, basically. And so uh, at this point, I've tried what I can try, and it's a no-go for me. I feel like if I bring that fish in now, I'd just be contributing to, like, uh, you know, fish abuse, basically. Because I haven't found a place that transports them correctly, treats them correctly. They're so emaciated when they come in. It's just sad. Um, and, you know, it takes weeks for fish to lose that much body condition. And so I don't feel right uh, being part of that. So I hope to bring more Fantastiques in. But it's going to take a new supplier to come on board, and that doesn't happen very often. And it's going to take them being willing to ship to our standards for that to happen. Glass NYC, I received my order today and everything came in alive and healthy and much bigger than expected. Only one bag had a very slight leak. Oh, you did have one leak. See, that's very unusual. Um, Glass NYC, was that leak through both bags or was that leak only the inner bag leaked into the outer bag or did it leak through the inner bag and through the outer bag and actually get the inside of the box a little bit wet? Um, okay, so we had one. And thank you for letting us know, Glass NYC. Much appreciated. David Allen. Hey, Dan and team. Just wanted to say thank you for all that you do. My Cory breeding project is fully underway, and I've got numerous fry, fat, and sassy. Awesome, David. Well, hopefully you raise lots of them, and I can buy them from you. 
oh, I'd love to be able to source more quarries from hobbyist breeders because it's so hard to get them ex from the industry breeders and suppliers in good shape. It's just, in general, they don't do a good job with quarries. Kate Hull, thanks for the peacock gudgeons. Have fry eggs and multiple breeding pairs. Awesome, Kate. That is great news. Congratulations. Hope you get tons of babies. Those are so fun to raise up. Good news, those fry, once, when they first hatch, when they first hatch, they just wriggle. But once they hatch and they're free swimming and they're ready to eat, they're big enough to eat baby brine shrimp. So that makes them pretty easy to raise up. You don't have to do any micro foods. Not saying that it wouldn't be helpful to have like some rotifers or paramecium or something, but I've raised many, many of them on, um, on just baby brine shrimp. Maybe a little clump of java moss as well so they can kind of graze on the little critters on that. But good for you. Christina, will you be getting more red tail hillstream loaches? I would love more. I'm getting ready to make a 72 gallon river biotope just for them. Aren't they pretty? Christina, I'm glad you got some and I'm glad you like them. Yeah, that is a fantastic fish. And I will be getting more in when I can find them again. They're not a fish that is regularly supplied uh, by anyone. So, um, Every now and then, I can track some down, but it takes some real doing, and they don't have many. It's not a fish that's easy for the suppliers to get, and that's why they're so expensive. But trust me, the moment I find someone that can get more, I'll, be, I'll, like, I'll literally buy them all. I, I love that fish. But I don't know when that will be. Like, I, I have no idea. This is such a funny industry. Um, people tell you they can get stuff, and then it never shows up. Or it'll literally be on their list, like on the supplier's list, and you'll order it and it won't show up. Like, and, and so like, it's hard to ever guarantee when something will be available. The industry just is uh, not good at that. Cody Miller, I have three male epistle Borrelii steel blue variation. Can you find females? I can. Um, I don't have any plans to bring that fish in again soon. And I can't request just females. So if, if I was to bring that in, I'd have to bring in like, you know, 100 of them or something, maybe 200 of them. And they could be all males. Like I don't control the sex ratio that they send me. So that's a, that one will be a little harder for me to do, Cody. I, I was breeding them for a while and then I could do, you know, better do that. But I... I haven't had that breeding project for a bit now. Tanya H, or Tanya, I suppose. When will, we, when will you get more Autocyclus vitatus? Uh, the group we have is getting close. We have a very good supplier for those Autocyclus. And we've been buying from them for a couple years now, and they do a very good job. But every now and then, a batch they send us doesn't do as well. And unfortunately, that's the case with our current batch. We've been working on a batch for three weeks or a month now, I think, to get them healthy. We're getting a lot closer. Um, we had them uh, worked up, you know, dissected and examined and all that, uh, I believe yesterday, to make sure that they're now clear of parasites and all that, and they are. They look good. So now it's just a question of getting a little more weight on them. And by the way, their weight's coming along. They're looking pretty good. So. I do hope to have more Autosynclus available, uh, hopefully by next week, hopefully. So what we know is that we've cleared them from parasites and all that. They seem, you know, nothing was found on the examination. Um, but when you just finish a round of medication, you, you want to give the fish a little while to recover from that because the medication itself can be hard on the fish. So just giving them a little more time. And I'm sorry, I know, I know it takes us forever sometimes, but, but the good news is <laughs> by the time you get that fish, it will have been like, you know, coddled and hugged and squeezed and taken care of in every way possible to get it healthy before it's sent to you. So I know waiting sucks. I, I hate it too. I'd love to be able to sell them right away. You know, I mean, 
our business would make so much more money if all the fish came in in good shape and they came in, we're like, great, they look fantastic and we could ship them, but to our customers, like immediately sell them. That would be amazing for the economics of our business. But that's not the reality. Reality is that sometimes it takes us months to get fish healthy. Often it usually just takes, you know, two weeks. That's our normal quarantine period. But these so far have been uh, three to four weeks, but they're getting really close. So yeah, it's just, uh, sometimes it's a process. Sierra Smith, I really want to keep Betta Sinorum, or Simorum, sorry. Are they difficult to keep? Not at all. They're super easy. Any advice for an intermediate fish keeper? The, the only real thing I think with them is have a tight fitting lid. If there's a hole or a crack in your lid, they'll jump out for sure. So that's the main thing to have. Besides that, no. They're super hardy. They eat everything. They'll eat flakes, they'll eat pellets, they'll eat fiber bites, they'll eat frozen brine shrimp, they'll eat frozen blood worms. Like, they are voracious feeders. You do want to have some hides available because especially if you only have a few, and especially when they're first in the tank, they're going to be shy. If you get a big group, they're not shy at all, you know, after a few days. But if you only have a few or one, it's going to take it a little while before it warms up to you. So have some hides available so it can get comfy. And also be patient. It can take a few weeks um, if they're not in a big group before they warm up. But they're super easy and hardy in my experience. Mancine. I received my order today. CPDs and Hillstream loaches arrived alive and looking healthy. Heat pack was 90 degrees and the bags were 78 or 79 to 80. Okay, yeah. That's the higher end of the range we want them at, but 79 to 80 isn't bad. Like mid 50s would be, or mid 50s, <laughs> that would be horrible. Mid 70s is, is, is like our perfect target temperature, but yeah, 79 to 80 is not bad. We keep all of our fish here in the warehouse at 79 degrees, so glad they arrived warm despite the cold weather, and thanks for the shipping report, much appreciated. What egg scatterer needs to be bred in captivity, asks Orange Cones. I would say any of the new pencil fish species. Um, those super reds, the Amayas or the Sinepas, Tenepas, however you say it. Um, Morton Thalari, the purple pencil fish, is that Ruburo caudalis? I can't remember the scientific name off the top of my head right now. Um, those, it would be amazing if those would be kept in bread by hobbyists. A raccoon tetras, imperial lapis tetras, black striped tetras, which is not an attractive name, but is a super attractive fish and is hard to find. Red cherry musel tetras, orange, Bolivian orange lemon tetras. Those are some. Um, Celestial Pearl Danios, there's a lot available in the industry, but they're almost all in horrible shape. They're almost all like emaciated and sick and don't live. So we're trying to build up a group of hobbyist breeders so we don't have to import them anymore. We have a pretty good supplier, but even then, when you buy from the best of the best on the industry side, it takes us, you know, a month often to get those fish healthy and ready for you. Now, almost all of them live but it takes a while to get them fat and ready. So um, we, we have found a supplier that does a decent job, but there's no one I'm aware of in the industry that provides them at a price point that the market will bear that does a good job consistently. Like, they do a good job, but, but they only do a good job compared to everyone else who does a horrible job. What we want is someone that provides healthy fish that don't all die on us, but that are also fat and sassy, right? So. Uh, CPDs would be great. Um, any of the axle rod eye type rasboras, those are very difficult to get in good shape. I have yet to find a supplier that can do it consistently. So that would be like the, there's the red, the green, and the blue varieties of those. So any of those would be wonderful. So that's some thoughts. Spanish pickles, this is why I trust you. Um, 
Why? Oh, we were talking about the shipping report. Yeah, I mean, that's... I think if you're transparent and demonstrate what you're actually doing, then, yeah, that would engender trust, right? That's a relationship, you know, on both sides. I think that takes trust on both sides. So, yeah. Well, thanks for the trust. And hopefully we deserve it, and hopefully we'll keep deserving it. I mean, every now and then we screw up. Every now and then a uh, fish gets by us, and it's like, ooh, that shouldn't have gone out. How'd that get through everything? Like, we have all these checks in place. Um, and whenever that happens, I just feel horrible. <laughs> but uh, I guess anytime humans are doing things, though, there's going to be a small margin of error. But in general, in general, I think we do a really good job. And by the way, if we don't, if you ever have a problem, just email us. Hello at dancefish.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at dancefish.com. And we will bend over backwards to take care of you. If indeed we did something, made an error. Uh, Jenny Seals. Any full green guppies coming in soon? No. Um, I've only got those once. Because my friend Scotty out in Los Angeles bred a whole bunch of awesome ones. And so I was able to get a bunch from him. But you know what? I will check. Scotty might have some available. Check on. Let me make a note. Yeah. Ooh, I need a drink. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hate to do that. Right in the microphone. Ugh. Oh, and I'm almost out of water. That's bad. Okay, check Scotty fish availability. He had awesome ones. They really did look nice. So I will check with that. Yeah. Luke Buck, any recommendations for tank mates for multi-shell dwellers? Ooh, that's rough, Luke. I mean, multis are small, but they can shred much bigger fish, and they will, unless that fish... Unless you have... A tank with a really tall water column and that fish will stay up high enough that they don't perceive it as a threat so provided you're not like in a low boy or something and you have a really tall water column in your tank there are some options cyprochromus are an option um lamprichthys tanganicanus is an option those are both from lake tanganica the sardine cichlid um, is what the cyprochromus are called and the uh, Lamprichthys tanganicanus, if you don't know that fish, we have it for sale. It is a lamp killifish fish from Lake Tanganyika, and it's gorgeous. These are absolutely beautiful. They get these really iridescent spots on them. They are very active. One of my all-time favorite killifish. I love this fish. And ours look like current, oh, well, here's a picture. Not a great picture, but, you know, ours are big enough that they're starting to show some color. I wouldn't say they're spectacular yet, but they are starting to show some color. About like that. Yeah, ours are about like that right now. Um, that's a very active, fast fish. It stays in the top level of the aquarium water for the most part, and it's fast like a Danio. So it would be, you know, hard for uh, a uh, shell dweller to get a hold of it. Spanish pickle, any cool new live bears? Well, uh, we do have the Microposilia picta here that I talked about earlier this evening. These will become available um, tomorrow. We'll list those tomorrow. And I do have a few others, um, but I don't have a list with me. Let's see here. Well, let me show you a few cool ones that we have. Well, you want new. We have some different types of guppies coming available. But no, I, I, I can't think of, like, like as far as will be available later this week. No, besides the Microposilia picta. Uh, Johnny, can you think of any? But we do have some more that will be coming available later next month, provided they show up in good shape. I have some neat ones on order. 
Kelly Foreman has gifted five Dance Fish memberships. Kelly's doing it again. Kelly, thank you so much, sister. I hope you're doing really well. Uh, please give my best to Jake. And uh, thanks for supporting us with the membership gifts. That's awesome. And Kayla's Aquatics and Exotics throwing down some pippy long stocking to put some pippy, some pep in our step. Thanks, Bob. Thank you so much. New friends, any suggestions for a 20 gallon tall for a fish that has lots of personality, either interactive or fun to watch? Have been going through your site over and over and I can't decide. Let's hear 20 gallon tall. I mean, I think dwarf cichlids are kind of the thing for that. I don't know the... Oh, okay, so a, a regular 20-gallon tank is what we're talking about, I think, when you say 20-gallon tall, the standard one. Um, well, I think gobies are fantastic if you're talking about personality. We have a bunch of scarlet gobies right now that um, those might be ready to list later this week. We have several rhinogobia species. So let me show you some options. Let's see here. Got to get to my website here. And let's look for rhinogobias. If you're looking for personality, these guys are awesome. Um, any of these rhinogobias. And by the way, this is a bad picture. This is actually a quite attractive fish. This my picture is horrible. <laughs> And uh, we have some more of these scarlet gobies. Hopefully, they're ready to go later this week. I'll have to, have to go take a close look at them. Um, they're healthy and stuff, but they, uh, for a while, they were, they were setting up their hierarchy, and they tore each other's fins up in some combat. But those are healing up nicely. I'll just have to check and see if they're good enough at this point. But uh, these... Nanatiensis, let's see if I can find you a better picture of those than mine. Let's see here. I think this will give you an idea what they look like. These guys are pretty fun. So full of personality. So if personality is what you want. I don't think you can go wrong with gobies. Melody Ross, what are the hottest nano fish right now? What do you sell the most of? Right now it's probably the chili rasbora. Um, and I think the reason for that is first of all, uh, we have worked really hard with the suppliers to have them ship to us in such a way that they get to us in good shape. So we have a good supplier who treats them right. So they get to us fat and sassy and in good shape. So they'll, they'll thrive for you. Like anyone here, if you're in the chat, if you've bought chili rasboras from us, what's your experience been? My guess is, my guess is, Melody, that people are going to say that, that they're doing great. Even though that's often thought of as a very delicate fish. It's not. It just has to be treated right in the supply chain, that's all. Um, and for a while, those weren't available. So for a few months, uh, they were not available. Now they're available again, so they're, they're really, really selling fast because people have been waiting for them. Um, but perennially, perennially, is that the right term? <laughs> Generally, Celestial Pearl Danios um, and Pseudomuga Luminatus are ones that move really well for us because we just do a good job with them and they're hard to get healthy. Um, we also sell a lot of Cardinal Tetras and Ruminos. I'm not sure if you consider those nano fish. The Hummingbird Tetra? Oh, if you don't know this fish, this one is going like crazy for us. This little guy. It's a tiny little nano tetra. Um, really unique looking. I wish I could get a picture that really showed their true self, but nice red on the tail, kind of transparent fish with some iridescence, just a really unique little tetra. So that's another one that's selling really well. Uh, bumblebee gobies always sell really well for us. 
the, the Stiphodons, if you consider those dwarfs or nanos. So there's several. But like the hottest for the last month or so, the last few weeks or whatever, has been the chili rasbora, just because there's been a pent-up demand for them since they were unavailable in the industry for quite a while. How are those Hawaiian Viriatus that you were showing off a few weeks back? They are disappointing is how they are. They're awesome, but I am having the hardest time getting them healthy. They look great, and then, you know, every few days there's a couple dead. So we've examined them. We're trying to figure them out. I don't know, Brian. I Honestly, with this group, um, I'm, I'm not sure. I think at this point I need to... I mean, I've sent them to a lab, but I think I need to do that again, maybe to a different lab or just give them a new sample and see if they can find something because I'm at a loss. I don't know what's wrong with them. And I believe that's right. I don't have the veterinarian's reports right in front of me, so I'm going, kind of going off memory here, but I, I believe I'm being correct about that. I don't think they've found anything yet. John Snow Radio have always wanted some of your half beaks. Um, Wondering if the rowdy Beck 40 pencil fish would be too much for them. The males even chase adult coletis. Um, I don't think they'd be too much because the half beaks are going to stay up at the top. So, I mean, we keep half beaks with, with lots of different fish. And they tend to be okay as long as those fish aren't ones that always go up to the top and stay there. And in my experience, the Beck Ford pencil fish tends to be like in middle of the tank. They aren't really a top dwelling species, middle to bottom layer. In fact, yeah, um, more so than the top. Now it depends on how the tank is set up, but the way we have tanks set up, they're generally in the bottom and well, they're kind of all over. They don't just hang out at the top though. So I actually think you'd be okay with those. Um, that being said, I don't know if I've tried it. I'm assuming the top will have some plant cover. Those half beaks are going to want some cover up there. So if you can have like a quarter to a third of the tank with some floating plants with long root systems so they can really get up in there and get away if they needed to, then I think you'd be fine. Um, trying to think though, I don't know if I've ever kept Beck 40 with half beaks. So I, I don't know that for sure, but my gut says it should, it should be okay. Again, though, I haven't tried it, so I don't know. Wendy is sidetracked. A BBC came across my face. A BBC bit. Oh, a BBC bit came across my Facebook about noisy fish. Danalena cere cerebrum. It's not flashy, but I love the unique ones. It makes a loud noise for its size. Really? Yeah, I, I have heard of this little Danio. Uh, let's show people what it is. I didn't know they made a noise, though. Let's see if it's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do know this fish. It's like the smallest fish in the world or close to it. Um, sounds as loud as pneumatic drill. Well, how did I not know that? And, like, how come, how come no hobbyists have reported that? Like, I remember Rachel O'Leary years ago did a feature on them, I believe, on her YouTube channel, if I'm remembering right. I think it was her. And there was no mention of a noise. Okay, now I've got to learn more. You're going to send me down a rabbit hole. I'm going to start reading all kinds of research. <laughs> I don't have time. Oh, man, how am I going to do this? Um, <laughs> Matt Loftus. I bought six Ivantacara bimaculata, and they're doing great. Absolutely awesome little fish. I was curious if the females have a white spot by their anal fin. Thanks for the fish. Um, Matt, that group that you bought from us, that, that's the first time I've ever had that fish in person. So I don't know very well how to sex them. Does anyone here know? Um, can anyone here answer Matt's question better than I can? This is, that was, that's literally the first time I've seen that fish in person was a, f a few weeks ago when we brought them in. So I don't know that much about them. Spoiled sushi, what happened to those albino stirbys? Um, if they're not up yet, they should be up later this week. They're doing great. Stirbys. 
let's see, did we get those up? We haven't got them up yet, so that's one that should be up uh, later this week. Hopefully tomorrow or the next day. Let me just make a note here. They've been rock solid for us. Normal stir buys have been a struggle. It's been difficult to find. I think in the last month I've tried three or four different sources for them. Um, and no one's got fat, sassy stir by right now. So we're just pumping food into them <laughs> and trying to get them to gain the weight they need so we can sell them. But the albinos were good from the get-go. So that's a, you know, that's a head scratcher. Rainy, thank you so much for the super chat. Will you ever get more uh, woo, Arubinesco? How do you say that? Carino Tetrodon Arubesco. Irubesco, I think that's how you say it. A red-tailed, uh, red-eye, red-tailed dwarf puffer or something like that. Um, I hope to in the future, but it's not a fish I can bring in right now. They absolutely murder each other. In my experience, um, Chelsea and Bob can keep them without any problem in groups together. I can't, in my experience, they just kill each other. So that makes it very difficult for me to bring them in because that means I have to put one fish per tank and I have 40 gallon tanks. I don't have one that's like all divided up or anything like that. So until I build a system where I can put one fish per tank or have a tank divided up specifically for them or something, then I'm not able to bring them in. But I do plan to do that. I just don't know when I'll be able to get to it because that's a fish everybody wants and I do have a very good source for them. But right now it's hard to do it um, because of their aggression. I'm just not set up for it. But you have good taste. That's an absolutely stunning fish. Okay. Rogue. Do you ship differently in the summer, particularly to the hot regions? Yes. Uh, we, well, in the, in the winter we use hot packs, and in the summer we use cold packs. So it's basically the same. Nice insulated box. Uh, UPS next day air. Um, just whether there's a cold pack or a hot pack in, or no pack, depending on the weather, you know, just depends on the season and the weather and where it's going. And so every, every order that I send out, I check the temperatures. So when I go to process the orders, I get a report that generates and it tells me who bought the fish, where it's going, what kind of fish. And it tells me the temperature here in Billings, Montana, because the fish uh, have a short stop in Billings, Montana at their airport on their way to Louisville, Kentucky. I get that temperature as well, as well as the high and the low temperature of where they're going, where the customer lives. So that way I can pull up any report and see the temperature journey that fish is going to take as it's being sent to the customer. And based on that, I can know, oh, those temperatures are going to be fine. So no heat pack, no cold pack, they'll be fine. Or, oh, it's pretty cold there. Let's put in some heat packs. Or, oh, it's going to be very cold in there. Let's put in two heat packs and make them really big heat packs. Or, oh, it's going to be warm there, but it's going to be cold here. Let's put in a small heat pack that will burn down before it gets to them. So it's warm here, but not too hot when it gets to them. Or, hey, it's super hot right now. Let's put a cold pack in. Or, you know, whatever it is. But I... Each point on their journey, I know the temperature. And so that's why we're able to kind of customize each uh, box that we send out temperature-wise and use heat packs or cold packs as necessary to make them work. Now, every now and then I get it wrong and uh, they arrive a little too hot or a little too cold, but almost always they arrive at, at, at a good temperature. And even if they do arrive a little too hot, let's say. Um, we pack with pure oxygen and we do a very rigorous process to make sure that the water the fish is shipped in is clean and stays clean during shipping, that the fish isn't gonna poop in the bag and make it all foul and gross. And what that means is, even if the water gets warm, there's still plenty of oxygen in the water. What tends to kill fish when they get too hot in aquariums or during shipping at least is not so much that they die of the heat, although that could happen in some cases, but that they're oxygen deprived. The, um, if you're in a bag of water and it's an enclosed system and you're in the mail or you're being shipped somewhere, 
and you get real hot and your water's not really clean, then with that heat comes rapid metabolism. So the fish needs more oxygen. Also with that heat comes an explosion of the microbiome around that fish. All the bacteria and little protozoans and stuff that are in the water with the fish just explode in population and those all consume oxygen as well. So the fish consumes a lot of oxygen, all the organisms in the bag with the fish explode in population and consume oxygen, especially if the water is dirty, if the fish poops in the bag or whatever, then there's tons of nutrients for all the bacteria and little protozoans and they just go haywire because the temperature's higher and so their metabolism, their reproduction increases. So all of that robs oxygen from the water and that problem is compounded by the fact that the warmer water gets, the less oxygen it can hold. So that's a real issue and that's usually what kills fish um, when they're shipping or whatever and the temperature gets too high. So we don't want the temperature to get too high and it rarely does, but in the few instances it does, the fish are usually still okay because the water is clean and we pack with pure oxygen. So there's still ample oxygen saturation in the water even if it gets warmer than we would want it to. So anyway, that's probably more than you wanted to know about fish shipping and temperatures, but that's a couple things about how we go about it. Vincent, second live. Hey, welcome, we got you back. Must be doing something right. Really enjoying, how often do you have Santa Maria Endlers, Hardiness, setting up a new tank now, now my eye on them once the tank is ready, thank you. Um, so I love Santa Maria Endlers. Um, I once spent, was it two years developing a Santa Maria Endler line? Like, I can't remember if it was a year, two years, something like that. Um, so that's a fish that's near and dear to my heart. They're very hardy. In fact, any Endler, any guppy in my experience is hardy. And I know, wait, 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 don't, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. If they're supplied correctly, that's the caveat. So, um, there's a lot of talk around about, oh, they're not as hardy as they used to be because of inbreeding. Or um, they're not as hardy as they used to be because the fish farms in Asia where most of them are supplied from are just mud ponds full of disease. Or there's all these speculations about it. And there might be a little bit of truth to a few of those things. A few of the, the, the general theories about why guppies slash handlers slash live bears in general are not as hardy as they used to be. Um, I've got, I, I, I've got a whole newsletter on it here. So if you go to the Dance Fish website, um, <laughs> I break it down for you. There, if you scroll to the bottom and go to view previous newsletters, Guide to Healthy Live Bears Part 2 and Guide to Healthy, Healthy Live Bears Part 1 was in June, Part 2 was in July. Um, if you look at that, I dive really deep into the the reasons we've seen that live bears are less healthy than they used to be. And just real quickly, it's disease, but not the general disease people thinks about. Um, there's, there's a specific virus that is out there. And if the suppliers of your fish, if their stock are infected by this virus, they're just not going to thrive for you. After the rigors of import and everything and going through all the stages of the supply chain, uh, they're just that virus is gets a chance to take hold because the stress of that whole experience weakens their immune system so that's one major reason and the second major reason is because of overcrowding during shipping they just pack so many in a bag that they become uh, they get too much exposure to ammonia and that damages the fish um, and they tend to die off over a few weeks after that happens so that's what we've found. Those two causes, that, that virus and ammonia exposure due, due to overcrowding during shipping are the main reasons why live bears are not as healthy as we remember from when we were kids, right? Or I do at least. So, um, so if you have a supplier that does not have that virus, and, and we found suppliers that are virus free, and if they're supplied correctly, meaning they're packed with in light enough density <coughs> that they aren't exposed to ammonia, 
then they're usually hardy. Now, yes, they can come in with a few parasites or anything, but not necessarily any more than a lot of other fish. Um, and they're pretty easy to, to treat, most of them. So I would say that in my experience, they're no less hardy than any other tropical aquarium fish. You know, your normal tetras or whatever, provided that they're supplied humanely. So uh, that holds true for those Santa Maria endlers as well. And the, the group we have, they've been breeding for a long time. We might be like on our third generation of those. So the odds are that the fish you get might have actually been bred and raised right here at our facility. All right. And they're gorgeous. I, I love that fish. Okay, mountaintop puffer keeper. What could I run in a dwarf pipefish tank that would ignore their eventual fry? Ooh. Oh, okay. I was thinking cherry shrimp or potentially pom-pom crabs. I've never tried the crabs. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I, my, my mind at first went to fish, and I was like, ooh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that could be. Um, we have had cherry shrimp in with ours, and there was no problem. I've never kept pom-pom crabs myself, so I don't know about that. But yeah, we kept uh, Neocaridina in with, with the pipefish. In fact, we had a colony of Neocaridina and scuds and stuff kind of breeding in that tank that we kept the pipefish in so that between feedings they could eat baby scuds and, and baby shrimp as they were released from, from the mothers. So... Um, in my experience, scuds and uh, neocaridina shrimp both worked well with pipefish, with pipefish babies. Dragon, do all fish forage for food such as goldfish and corridors? No, um, there's, oh man, fish are fascinating. So they have adapted, some of them are super specialized. Like fish have had a long time to figure out oh, I can take advantage of this niche because no one else is doing that. And they, they, over time, adapt to that niche and become very specific. Um, I'm thinking specifically right now of like the, the South American leaf fish. Maybe they call it the Amazon leaf fish. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what it's called these days. But check this out. So this is a fish that imitates a leaf. And it does a good job. Here's the stem, right? Here's the leaf. There you go. There's a handful of them. You couldn't tell those weren't leaves at a casual glance, right? And specifically, what these are is a piscivore. These eat fish. They are a straight-up um, predator. And I have never seen them trained to eat anything but living organisms, live fish. You can get them to eat like live shrimp as well, glass shrimp, uh, grass shrimp, that kind of thing, ghost shrimp. But check this out. They basically move really slow like a leaf. That allows them to get very close to their prey. And then this happens. Look at that mouth. It extends like a trumpet. And when it extends, it, and it happens in the blink of an eye. I've, I've seen these guys eat. They're amazing. It creates this vacuum that just sucks their prey into their mouth. Here's another picture of it. Look at that. Big old mouth all extended. So this is an example of a fish that does not forage. This is a predator that only eats um, other fish, or it'll eat shrimp and stuff like that too. But it's designed to be a piscivore, to eat shrimp, or to eat fish. So that's one example. Another example would be like a half beak. Um, half beaks are super interesting. Let's see here. So, on almost every fish, it's the lower jaw. Actually, here's our picture. We'll do our picture. It's the lower jaw that moves, right? The lower jaw goes down, and that's how the fish opens its mouth. The half beaks are different. It's the top jaw that moves. This, this has a hinge on it, and the top piece of the jaw will go up to grab their prey. And that is because they have evolved to live right at the surface of the water. And what they're gonna do is when a little insect lands on the surface, they're gonna go and grab it. 
So they lift up their top jaw and grab it and snap down on top of it. That's how they catch their prey. So these are one that doesn't go around and forage on the bottom like goldfish or catfish. These stay at the surface and they're specialized predators. Now, they will eat uh, flake food and small pellets and things, but they're not a forager in the sense that I think you're talking about. So, um, so no, there's all kinds of fish that have very specialized niches that they live in that aren't generalists. Corridors are generalists. Uh, I mean, they, they need high protein, but... And, and they do eat mostly on the ground. They're, I guess they're not that much of a generalist, but they'll pretty much eat a lot of things just by foraging around in the sand. Goldfish are a true generalist. They'll eat anything that they come in contact with. They eat a lot of vegetation and stuff. Tetras go around and forage. Uh, your barbs do. Your live bears for sure. Like lots of fish do that because it's a very good way to make a living. If you can eat lots of things and just kind of go and eat stuff all day long and it's maybe not high maybe it's not nutrient dense food maybe it's just detritus and things but there's still some caloric value in that then you can do that or you can specialize and and take advantage of a higher caloric diet um yeah there's it's just amazing it's so interesting the way they've uh radiated out and fish have found all kinds of ways to make a living eric tarrant um, have you seen Ivanacara by Maculata? Have you had them in stock before? Yes, we've had them before. We just sold out. Um, I expect a new batch to arrive tomorrow. So I know someone that breeds them and they're sending me more and they should arrive tomorrow. So provided that happens and they're in good shape, then they should be through quarantine in two weeks. We always quarantine everything for at least two weeks. And hopefully in about two weeks, we have more for sale because they're beautiful little hard to find fish. Luke Cochran, gifted one dance fish membership. Luke, thank you so much. Much appreciated. Thanks for uh, gifting out a membership. That's like a massive way to support the channel. Um, let's go ahead and do the giveaway. I know it's not quite the end of the stream, but sometimes I like to do the giveaway a little early so I can reward people who aren't here. You know, sometimes people just come at the very end. They just show up for a few minutes at the end and enter the, the drawing in, in the hopes of winning something. But then there's folks like you guys that, you know, come for other reasons, <laughs> not just for the giveaway. So I, I want to reward that. So we'll do the giveaway now. This is for free shipping, any size order. You buy it from us, we'll ship it for free. And the winner is Daniel. Hey, Daniel McNamara. Congratulations, Daniel's a member of the channel and a frequent contributor to the chat. So Daniel, I'm thrilled to hear that you have won. Um, I'm gonna set the timer here. You have two minutes, as you know, to chime in and let us know you're here. And you do that just by entering something in the chat. Could You can say whatever you want, but gotta say something in the chat to let us know you're here. If you have not done that in two minutes, then you forfeit your winnings and we will draw somebody else. Connor says, hey, Dan's Fish and Johnny, uh, the 236RB and Super Whites are doing well and are breeding. Oh, Connor, I'm so glad to hear that. Anytime anyone drops the money necessary to acquire either of those species, then I'm thrilled to hear when they're successful breeding them. That's great. Connor, I'd love to buy so many of those from you. <laughs> I'd love to buy that fish from you. Oh, and if we can get the price point down a little bit, that would be great. They're so expensive. But I'm glad to hear that. That's great news. Serpacam... Oh, wait. Oh. Sir Pac-Man. I was like, Serpacamon? <laughs> Sir Pac-Man. I'm like, Serpacaman. <laughs> <laughs> That's the epitome of hyperbole. Oh, Brian Regan. Okay, I have a 75 gallon tank that is cycled, but then I am going to be rescaping and changing out the livestock. Do you have any out of the ordinary recommendations that would be happy long term? Oh, yeah, lots. Um, and a 75 gallon? Okay. If you want out of the ordinary, I would do a massive group of horse face loaches on the bottom. Those are very unique fish, uh, highly specialized, highly adapted to live in sandbars. Um, so they'll keep your sand clean 
and they're awesome. They're not colorful, but they're uniquely shaped and they're just amazing. A big group of those would be great in a 75 gallon. And then if you want out of the ordinary, for the very top, I don't know, maybe some of the rare half beaks um, would be cool up there. I, I like marble hatchet fish a lot. We have a group of those that should be available soon. And I don't know if they're extra, I don't know how, I mean, they're such a unique fish, hatchet fish. So yeah, I, I'd say that that's another one that's highly specialized the whole hatchet fish family. They're basically uh, freshwater's version of a flying fish. That's why I have that big hatchet shape. That's for a big keel bone that can support all the muscles necessary. So when a predator is chasing them, they can jump out of the water and fly. Fly, right? I mean, glide like a, like a flying fish would out in the ocean. So I think I would do horse face. If you want, you know, kind of cool fish that are unique, Horse face loaches on the bottom, hatchet fish on the top, and I like marble hatchets a lot. And then in the middle, I, I don't have any. I'm struggling to find a way to get them healthy, but I love um, threadfin rainbows. Oh, that is a beautiful fish. That's another fish. For those that don't know that one. Red fin or feather fin rainbow fish. These guys are absolutely fantastic. Like a big group of those in the middle. Now I know it's a 75 gallon, you can get larger fish, but it, it, personally what I like, and you do you, but you ask my opinion, so I'll tell you what I like, is like, I don't know, I probably get 50 of these, 75 of these, something like that. There's, they don't get, now I get maybe about 50 of them in a 75 gallon. They don't get massive, and they're displaying constantly, and they are absolutely stunning. A big group of these in the midsection, that's a unique fish. Like, that is just a very specialized fish. So I don't know. That might not be what you want, but that's where my mind goes. A bunch of horse face loaches on the bottom, a bunch of threadfin uh, rainbows in the middle, and hatchet fish on top. I think that would be cool. Okay, it's been two minutes. So, has it? Yes, it's been two minutes, so we will see. Daniel, you haven't chimed in. Daniel McNamara. Oh man, I feel a little bad because Daniel's here all the time. So I would love it if they won, but I don't see, oh, lol the comments. So Daniel did chime in, it just didn't show up. That's so weird. So usually it shows up here, but it didn't, but it did show up here. So. Daniel, congrats, you have won. Um, so you probably know this by now, Daniel, because you've been here a lot, but now please send us an email to hello at dancefish.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at dancefish.com. Uh, and we will get your uh, free shipping set up for you. Thanks for uh, supporting. Thanks for being active tonight and participating. And man, thanks for participating so often. Uh, we really appreciate you being here and being part of the community. Okay, chat just jumped, so I'm scrolling up again. The next one I can see is JM3RZ. Do you sell anything besides fish? We do sell shrimp. We do sell snails. But it's all like live freshwater aquarium animals. We don't do plants or anything like that. Um, uh, if you do want plants, I'd refer you to our partner, Aquarium Co-op. And if you click on the description of this video, there's a link there that if you buy from them, we get a little kickback. But no, we just sell mostly fish, but some shrimp, some snails. Vincent says, thanks, appreciate the depth of your info. You're welcome. Mama Duck says, I have three pom-com, pom-com, pom pom crabs, and they are just a ton of fun. Yeah, one day I'll, one day I'll try them. Jay's Aquatics, why do y'all not carry fancy molly species? I've seen the Liberty mollies, but why not any others? Hmm. Well, first of all, 
It's kind of difficult to get your hands on wild type mollies, but are you sure that you've looked at the website completely? Because we have at least a few. We've got the Liberty Molly here. We've got the Pacific Molly here. And we'll also have some Pocelia Gilli that will be coming available soon. If they're not already available, let's see here. Yeah, we have a group of Posili Gilli that's uh, ready to go, so those should be listed soon. Let me make a note here. But, uh, yeah, good luck finding another fish store that has even three wild-type mollies available. They're not easy to get. Mia Wolf, so much passion. Yeah, there has to be, otherwise why are we even here? You need to be weird about something in life or you're not living. For me, I'm weird about fish. I don't know why, but I'm, I can geek out on them forever. No clue why. I just know that I love them and I never get tired of them. Garage Gills. I like that name. Any issue with mixing your peacock gudgeons and bumblebee gobies with my block Moscow guppies? I've never tried peacock gudgeons with bumblebee gobies. They kind of occupy the same areas of the aquarium, so there could be some conflict there. I have kept peacock gudgeons with guppies, and I'm trying to remember if there were any torn fins. So with the bumblebee gubbies, I don't know if the bumblebee gubbies and gudgeons will get along, first of all. And then I can't remember if the peacock gudgeons ever nipped at the guppies' fins. I've kept them together. Was it a problem? I'm sorry, Garage Gills, I cannot remember. Anyone here, have you kept uh, either bumblebee gobies or peacock gudgeons with guppies? Long, uh, black Moscow guppies. So th these are going to be a long tail type guppy. And if so, did you have any problems or did it go okay? Let's, let's see if we can help uh, Garage Gills out. Creed Moore Aquatics is... Tachysaurus trilineatus likely to come back into stock, or is it one of those rarely available from suppliers? Um, it's sometimes available. I have two suppliers I can get it from. The problem is they don't do a good job, and so I've stopped bringing that fish in. Um, they're available. I just... Sometimes I'm tempted because I really like that. That's the highway catfish. For those that don't know this fish, check this sucker out. This is a catfish out of China, and it is so cool. It doesn't get very big. Maybe tops out at three, four inches, something like that. And look at it. Look at this beauty. And this is why it's called the highway catfish, because it's got like the dashed line down the center of a road, right? It looks like a highway. I've kept them a few times, and uh, I've loved them every time. But, yeah, the suppliers, I can get them from just... Um, if I can find a supplier that can get me nice, healthy stock and treats the fish right, then, then I'll do it. But so far, I haven't found that person. So I can get them. I just choose not to at this time. Oink, Master Supreme Forever. It was so awesome to meet you at the Keystone Clash. I'm Chattanooga Ed's girlfriend. Oh, I remember. <laughs> I remember the, the, oh, they called you Oink, right? Yeah. Would you consider neon gobies to be beginner friendly? Yes, absolutely. And how many minimum should I keep together? Um, that's one where I think you can get away with keeping a single one. Like, I don't think that there are fish that, like has to be with um, con specifics, but but if you do keep a group together, you're going to see interesting behavior and a lot of interaction. There'll be a lot more of that goby like clowniness going on. Um, so you can keep anywhere from one to five hundred together. I would say it depends on the size of tank. 
It's just, uh, if you keep one, they're still going to be cool, but they're not going to interact as much because there's no one to display to or anything like that. So, I know, I personally, I like a dozen or so gobies together just because I think then you get a lot of interaction. So, yeah. Anyway, hope you're doing well. Good to hear from you. And yeah, the Keystone Clash was amazing. Five minutes. Okay, we're almost to the end, but we're going to go all the way. My plectos arrived today in good shape. Thanks, says Dave Jones. Awesome, Dave. I'm glad to hear it. Oh, chat just jumped again. 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 It's very jumpy today. Okay, here we go. All right. And Dave, thanks for letting us know. It's always nice when we hear how the fish do on the other side. And uh, both, if you know, good and bad. We want to hear the good for sure because it keeps us motivated, but we also want to know if there's any problems. Okay, the next one I can see is Sir Pac Man 742. I just looked up what you mentioned and it looks like a plan to me. Thanks for your help and everything you do for the hobby. You're welcome. If anything I said was helpful, then hey, time, then it's worthwhile doing the stream, I suppose. And good luck to you in your endeavors. Fiddy, can you, do you have any recommendations on algae eaters that can go with a Senegal bite, Bashir, or Bicher, or however you say that? Tur um, let's see here. <laughs> An algae eater that is not going to end up being eaten by a Senegal biter. Are there any ancestral species that get reliably big enough that they're not going to get stuck in the throat of a Senegal biter? Maybe that's where I would look. I mean, ah, that's a rough one. So, but that's the, that's the group of fish I'm thinking on. Some kind of ancestral species that is big enough that it could not be seen as food by a, a Bashir. That's my best thought. I'm sorry. I wish I had a better thought. Well, what about like Nerite snails? I don't think, would a Bashir eat a snail? I, I don't know. I haven't kept many Bashirs. At least not with snails. Maybe they would, because they smell their food so well. Maybe they totally would attack snails. But if not, then maybe some snails are in order. Coro Works. I know you're limited to freshwater only, but do you have any recommendation, partnership, or collaboration with or for saltwater fish retailers? Coro, I don't. I just don't know anything about that world. So I don't have any recommendations for you. I'm sorry. Steven, what is the largest fish that you have presently for sale? It is the Mountain Grunter. They're big. Ours are, I don't know, six inches. These guys. That's kind of their juvenile slash stress color. And then as they get older, they, they turn black with gold spots. These are a fantastic fish. They're personable. They're active. Uh, they're super rare, and I think the color is amazing. I like that gold on the dark color. And by the way, it changes with their mood, which is cool. So they can look like this, kind of vertically striped. They can look like this, kind of horizontally striped. They can look pure black. They can look black with a little gold on them, like these. Or they can have a lot of gold on them, it's, it, and they change all the time according to mood. So, But that's the biggest one we have right now. They're... Yeah, they're hefty. Any fish will do also gifted a membership. Thank you so much, any fish will do. Much appreciated. Pardon me, but my nose itches like crazy. Oh, you know, you don't want to scratch your nose in public, but sometimes the itch is so bad. Jamie Green, I have nine chin. Okay, do I know this fish? Oh, Solosi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a 60 breeder. What would you add for more color or leave it as it is? Well, Solosi aren't all that aggressive. I mean, you could definitely add, you say color? I don't know if you see these as colorful, but you could definitely add Synodonus catfish to that tank. 
if it's a big enough tank and um and kind of has a, a a high enough water column then you could do some large rainbows in that tank too i think some large rainbow fish yeah i think those would go well if you have some rock work down on the bottom for the celosi to to stay down in then the rainbow fish mid water that are big you know if they're if they're bigger then i think they would do fine i've always liked celosi i like the sexual dimorphism between the blue and orange you always know what sex ratio you have and you get two varieties two color varieties for the price of one it's kind of a neat little fish yeah but as far as Mag mabuna go i don't think celosi is you know particularly aggressive all mabuna are kind of aggressive but celosi i think are a little more mild okay we're out of time thanks for being here everybody we're going to close this down by thanking our moderators for being here thanks guys really appreciate you for thanking all the members of the channel, especially folks that gave away memberships. Thanks for doing that. Anyone that threw money at us, thanks for the super chats. Always appreciated, never required, but every bit helps. Um, if you were active in the chat, thanks for making this a lively hangout where people could chat among themselves and have a good time. Um, if you're listening, if you're lurking, hail the Lurker Nation. If you're listening to the replay, hello from the past. And if you're listening on the podcast, first of all, my apologies for taking so long to get all these listed. Um, I am so behind. I'm a few months behind getting these up on the podcast. Um, and second, thanks for listening. We'll be back next week, I think. Oh, I should say this. We have an import coming in Wednesday of next week. Depending on the time it lands, I may be able to live stream and I may not. So I'll let you guys know if I can't. I'll do a community post and let you know. But hopefully I'll be here next week. If not, I'll definitely be here the week after that. Until then, have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye. Wrong arm. Bye-bye. There we go. <laughs>